are in favor of a more participative democracy, but not of one that can get rid of representation. Uh, it's impossible, right? With a few million people, how are you going to do without representation? So yes, representation, but how are these people elected? How are they controlled? Those are the key issues. So my name is Teresa Forcadas and I am a Benedictine nun. I'm also a medical doctor and a theologian and a political activist because in 2012, together with economist Arcadi Oliveras, we founded a political movement in our country, which is Catalonia, that uh, is called Constituent Process because there is a strong independence movement there and we thought that was a very good opportunity to join the independence movement yeah. with a real deep and fundamental concern for social justice. And so my name is uh, Sandro Mezzadra. I am a political theorist. Uh, I teach at the university in Italy, in Bologna. Uh, I'm also a political activist. Uh, I've been engaged for many years now uh, in movements uh, in Italy and in Europe and also outside of Europe. And particularly, I have been working over the last years uh, on topics uh, of migration uh, borders. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I can start with a question mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. And the question uh, has to do with the way in which uh, you imagine this constituent process uh, taking mm -hmm. place uh, in uh, <coughs> Catalonia. <coughs> which kind of relation uh, do you imagine between uh, Catalonia and Europe? This okay. is, uh, Okay. Um, actually, when you say how <coughs> do I imagine the process, before thinking of Catalonia and Europe, uh, my first point is how do I imagine the process in itself as a real yeah, constitutional process. And we knew in 2005 in Europe right, that uh, a constitution for Europe was being drafted, actually was written, and that was done in a way that no process was involved, if not the thought process of a single person, that it seems was this Carl de Stein, who was mm. uh, at the most responsible for that the text. Mm. And so that means exactly the counter model to what yeah. we would like mm. to be mm. uh, happening. <coughs> Inspiration we got from the Latin American processes. Mm. I've been in Venezuela four times, and I know the bad press that mm. Venezuela has, and some people that have been there don't even want to mention, <laughs> because unfortunately, it's right now not going very well. But I must say I was impressed. I was there in 2007 for the first time. And what impressed me the most is that I could meet people that looked marginal, had a, a way of dressing and a way of even speaking that you could consider that uh, personal at the margins of society, not a person that's uh, in the middle of it. And we're talking of their political opinions as if they mattered. I was very impressed by that. Yeah, I also spent some time in Venezuela. I was there for the first time in 2006. Okay. So I was kind of following the constitution. Would you process agree that, that this mm. was a But also in Ecuador, uh, in Bolivia. I mean, I spent some time in Latin yes, America over the last years, and I agree with you. I mean, it's okay. a great source uh, of inspiration. Uh, these people talked like that, and then I yeah. thought, uh, wait a minute, in what I thought, I realized, because you don't realize before, right? You, uh, one of these encounters, I realized in my country, it's not that marginal people, of course, don't talk as if their opinion counted. It's that politicians talk, don't talk as if their opinion counted. That I realized then that I had become used to a sense of utter disempowerment. Yeah. Not mm -hmm. only from people at the base of society, but from politicians. They talked as if decisions were made somewhere else, right? So that's how I imagine the constituent yeah, process. I'm really very Above much interested uh, in... Uh, in uh, these uh, constituent processes uh, in Latin America. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, we have a lot uh, to learn yes. from uh, those constituent processes. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a way, reversing uh, the, the standard colonial relationship uh, according to which of the South mm -hmm. has uh, to learn from the North. No, I <laughs> think the opposite is true nowadays. And then you mentioned yeah. about the relationship of Catalonia with Europe. Well, what happens nowadays in Europe is that mm, I don't have aga anything against the idea of Europe, but I don't consider that also an absolute in history or in geopolitics. For example, there is historically a very mm, strong ties in the Mediterranean between all the Mediterranean countries. Well, is it possible to imagine some kind of deeper alliance 
between the upper and the lower Mediterranean coast. That means the Maghrib countries and of course I know that this would mean a complete rethinking of some of the geopolitical strategies. Yeah, but I'm mentioning this because in the south of Europe nowadays certain characteristics are very different from those on the south. And when we became together and the euro became the currency for all of us, we know what happened, right? It was an inappropriate decision to make because some people spoke of the two velocities, two speed euro, and this has and is still hurting us in the south in a way that I believe uh, could be... An yes, but uh, I mean, the, there are of course uh, a couple of problems. One of them is that uh, in a way of uh, the last decades, uh, we, the peoples of uh, Southern Europe, uh, contributed uh, to the accumulation of wealth in Europe. <laughs> and now this wealth, in a way, is represented by the single currency. Mm -hmm. And uh, cutting the tie with uh, Europe uh, mm -hmm. would mean also to uh, kind of abandon this huge amount of wealth that has been produced uh, with our substantial contribution, mm -hmm. with uh, the exploitation of many mm -hmm. peoples of the South. Well, so I try to figure out uh, how uh, you imagine uh, the kind of constellation in which... Uh, okay, uh, I certainly don't imagine that this leaving the euro should mm. be a starting point. Like, yeah. we leave the euro. No, we have to fight, right? We have yeah. to fight mm. for a different way of uh, organizing this Europe as we understand it now, this European Union, to uh, mm, set the standards for the uh, fi financial success and for the mm, way that the country should be assessed in their... Uh, solidity economically and to think and to study its depth because there is no magic solution I have no magic solution that I'm gonna say okay that's how it's solved but the problems are so real and so strong that what I would like to see happening is a real change in the horizon the horizon as we have it now it's horrible Everybody uh, I knows. agree with you of course <laughs> I mean we are gonna go just worse these policies that we are implementing don't work or to say the best they are working for certain interests that have nothing to do with the interests of the people i don't believe those who devise the policies are just short in intelligence no, no, i course. believe they mm. obey to certain interests that go beyond the ones that the people have right so that's the main thing and then once we open this that's why a constituent process it's a good opportunity that would be only for a small country that would be catalonia but nevertheless you start at home right you start doing what you can because otherwise you make big plans and then it never implements well, yeah. so let's start if possible in a where you are each person where where, where he or she is to really put the real questions on the table. And one of these questions that I mentioned before, I wanted to use the opportunity of our, our dialogue to pose to you is because on studying constitutions and constitutional mm, uh, foundations and fundamentals, then I, of course, go back to 1789, right? Even if the American one is before, but this one in Europe has been the one that um, founds this modern political philosophy. And we encounter a notion, which is the notion of rights, placed at the very beginning of that uh, the Declaration, the declaration right of the Human yeah. Rights. And particularly, there is one right, which I believe if we don't challenge it in its absolute character, it's impossible to, to move forward. That's, of course, the right of private property. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right of private property, it's considered absolute. I said before, I'm a Benedictine nun. OK, the Catholic Church does not consider that an absolute right. It says. It is a right, and it has to be Although defended. it was able to negotiate uh, this right. Of course, right. of course. <laughs> you know, of course. I'm talking fundamentally, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And then we have all the shortcomings, but at least we, we just clarify the concept, <laughs> because I believe this discussion is too quick and linked to the threat of Sovietization, or we have centralizing uh, historical projects that have been those of communism, as understood in the Soviet Union, in China, and in Cuba, and that's something that people have uh, as very negative, and so this we don't want. And as if the alternative were capitalism as we understand. So this need to think beyond capitalism and to think alternatives, I think it's a major consideration if we are to draft a constitution. That, But my question was, no. do you believe that the notion of rights in itself sure. should be the main one, as opposed to, of course, the alternative would be the notion of need? Is that possible to think a constitution based on need and not based on rights? I think needs uh, should uh, figure prominently mm -hmm. in uh, any new uh, 
constitutional draft. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, should be, in a way, at the basis of uh, uh, a constituent uh, process. Mm -hmm. uh, I share uh, your uh, uh, radical criticism of the position of uh, uh, private property in the system uh, of constitutional rights uh, in Western uh, modernity. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, I would uh, emphasize uh, that there is an aspect in the language of rights uh, which is uh, important, mm -hmm. a kind of constitutional political subject uh, who is able to claim uh, the satisfaction of his or her needs uh, as a right mm -hmm. and not simply as a charity or something coming uh, mm -hmm. from above. So there is a moment of uh, empowerment uh, in the language of rights uh, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, okay. I would continue to consider important, uh, although uh, I also think that the needs uh, should be uh, one of uh, the reference points of Here the, the constitutional imagination. I guess. The yeah. philosopher that I have in mind is one maverick philosopher, <laughs> which is Simone Weil, yeah, yeah, that yeah. Albert Camus right, said yeah, in yeah. 49, as he published her last work, yeah. Either Europe takes that into account or we are doomed, mm -hmm. right? That's Camille, that's not suspect of being right-wing or, right? Mm -hmm. And what she opens her, her analysis with is the notion of obligation is primary to the notion of rights. And the notion, of, and it's linked to needs, and the rights are derivative, which she doesn't expel the rights, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. what I like of that is because when she makes this analysis of saying, right, we say you have rights, right? Everybody has rights, but that's false. You don't have them. If yeah, that, that, that's the one who has the obligation, I, I mean, if, if, you, if you take into account this moment of claiming, but, I mean, but it's let me autonomy, I mean, let me then uh, it is clear that you don't have rights. I mean, if you don't claim and, them, and here is the if point you don't build the power, uh, yes. power is another important kind uh, that's of That's the point, uh, and, and I mean we're here, Bale argues, mm -hmm. is to say, if you speak the language of right, which has this appeal that I agree and I don't have a problem with, but let's go a bit deeper. If, if you talk about rights, in fact, in history, in without exception, it has to do with power. It has to do with who has the violence. And if you have the violence, you impose your right. And if you don't have the violence, you are imposed. Inevitably, if you are talking the language of rights, right? If she says, and I don't know, oh that yeah, uh, no. <laughs> if you talk about needs, right? Then, of course, that's not solved. I don't have magic solutions, I already said. But if you talk about obligations, then it is that you have. You cannot honor, of course, but it's something that if society has attributed to do to you a given obligation, or especially if you speak about needs, even if anybody else recognizes that the need is there, and the need for eating, and the need for refugee, if you are expelled from one country, and the need for protection if there is a war, the need is something solid that if you base your self-understanding, and that's what, as a theologian, as uh, interests me at this moment the most, too, what is empowering people? If you think that having rights is what gives you dignity, that you have a dignity because you have rights, what happens when you clash as a woman, for example, I'm a feminist, right? I thought I had certain rights. I had to realize through my experience that this is far from clear that and I have This is because them, right? of uh, the relation between uh, rights and power. Exactly. Inside. But I mean, when I realize yeah. this, I become depressed. It's a very strong disempowerment because I built my self-consciousness and my self-worth on the notion of rights. And now I realize you have them. Because uh, I'm not saying you personally, <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, the gender relation. Uh, that <laughs> one has it. I don't. It's very complex also yeah, psychologically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I follow you perfectly. Okay. Uh, my point is that you don't get rid of the question of power and violence mm -hmm. uh, simply shifting uh, from one mm -hmm. language to another. I what think. about this self-subjectivity, <laughs> right? This understanding or is subjectivity, really right? How, yeah, how it's really important. It's, uh, it's the point of departure because of any discussion <laughs> about, about politics. For me. I mean, Our mm, culture mm, is mm, like, if you have needs, that's mm. somehow, I, I push the argument, but it's somehow shameful, right? It's better not to have them. No, I mean, you have to claim your needs. Okay, I like <laughs> I mean, that. You <laughs> have to like claim that. your needs, uh, and, and needs are not something stable. I mean, we have also to, to produce new needs. And uh, needs I mean. are what <laughs> makes us human. Yeah. Can yeah, we say that? I because totally agree with we say, you. I mean, and then needs is beautiful because you need to eat, and that means time, you are embodied, I mean, and you, are, you need to be protected. You depend uh, on uh, <laughs> cooperation. Exactly, with and others, you depend and with others, and you cannot fulfill yourself I mean. without this this kind of cooperation, which yeah. uh, 
I mean, anthropological is what yes. you say. I mean, yes. I, I, yes. I can follow your logic very well. The only thing I say is that, uh, I mean, the, the question of power and violence <laughs> remains. remains. Clear. You, have, you have to imagine also a way to and build counter power. Okay. So, know, the way I was thinking about in the Constitution would be if somehow, because of course this is an evolving dialogue now, right? You could find a way that the notion of needs and obligations, because you know, he, uh, right now we have rights, but it's the state has to um, guarantee those rights because the Constitution says the state, and so the human being. My relationship to you as a human being is obli oblivious, right? Or it's, it's forgotten, it, it's bypassed. What would be a possibility is if we have a need to eat, the obligation is for everybody, anybody who has more than needed to eat, there is a, an obligation to just. Yes, but uh, how do you implement uh, okay, <laughs> the obligation? Okay, okay. That's the question. That, <laughs> I, I, I'm That's sure question. that we are not going to solve w the problem with the paper, of, right? Yeah, but yeah, at least, course. is that a coherent approach? Because it's very different. It is, it is, yeah, it's yeah, very yeah, yeah, different yeah. because people yeah. now, you speak about the, the questioning of private property, and it's like a taboo. Right? It's like, oh, you want us to go back to whatever the Soviet Union is. It's really, I find this, right? It's, it's a, an impossibility almost to discuss it in rational terms and without the strong emotion. And so I would like to open up the space for this to be discussed. Uh, uh, um, I share uh, your, uh, your concern. Yes. <laughs> and I really don't want uh, to, to defend an anthropology based on rights uh, uh, against uh, the anthropology based on needs. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, I perfectly follow the way in which uh, you are uh, uh, describing uh, this anthropology of needs. Uh, I repeat, my only point is that uh, uh, if we talk uh, in a meaningful uh, way about uh, constituent processes, uh, constitution, mm -hmm. we have <coughs> to take seriously the question of power, which is also the question of violence. Yes. So then I mean here, the kind of regulation, the kind mm -hmm. of uh, constitutional assemblages. And here, there are a few things that I, we've been discussing in this group that I belong to and that I think that are important. And now it's another right. Uh, I move away from this discussion, which for me was the yeah. most important, the needs. And but of course, some of the things is in Spain right now. We have something called the Popular uh, Legislative Initiative, yes. right? Yeah. That legal figure, but it is non-binding. So people just gather together. We had a great effort for the transgenics, for example, to ban transgenics yeah. from our country. We gather more than, in Catalonia, more than 100,000 signatures, and with 50,000 you have enough for an ALT, ALT uh, yeah, yeah. that's a popular legislative initiative. We bring it to Parliament, and then Parliament has the power to decide whether they will consider or not. And yeah. they consider not. Yeah, it's the same in many European countries. finished, huh? Yeah. So this is... So, but it is again outrageous. a question of power. I mean, of course, it's of course. Again, a question of imagining a <laughs> kind of uh, distribution of power mm -hmm. uh, that uh, makes also a plurality of uh, sources of law possible. I mean. So, binding yeah. legislative yeah. initiative, I think it's it's a very key element. But also, there is this figure called uh, veto referendum. Yeah. And veto referendum would be a way to control the legislative chamber, right? The parliament just drafts a law, and when this law, before it's a, applied, we have uh, this institute in Italy. You could have, yeah. uh, you have it yeah. in Italy, yeah. the yeah. veto, but yeah. do you use it? Oh, yes, we use it, yeah. but uh, I mean, there are constitutional mm -hmm. complexities uh, to, the, to the issue. I mean, but because there were some very, very important uh, referendums, veto referendums. Mm -hmm. That we don't have that in Spain, and this is another, like, uh, and then another issue would be the electoral law, that mm -hmm. we call it law, because usually it's left to the uh, parliament to make mm -hmm. a law about mm -hmm. it, but I believe that should be in the constitution. That should The constitution should also rea realize how important it is to distribute power, right? Yeah, yeah. How are you going to elect the representative people? Because yeah, I'm yeah. all in favor mm -hmm. of a more participative democracy, but not of one that can get rid of representation impossible right with a few million people how are you going to do without representation so yes representation but how are these people elected how are they controlled those are the key issues